quick heads up, this video does contain some very sensitive subject matter, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. And if you have a story you want to send my way, go to AsTheRavenDreams.com and click the button to do so. And of course, thank you. To start this story, I need to mention that it should probably have a content warning. What happened was tragic, and certainly traumatizing for myself and everyone else involved, and if your listeners have trouble listening to violent situations, I highly recommend that they not listen to this story. I grew up in a very quiet neighborhood. There was rarely anything that happened in the area, and the only time I remember the cops being out there besides this instance, was when one of the kids from a nearby area decided to break into a house that was for sale. Nothing violent ever happened on the block, and there was never any reason for anyone to think anything would. Every year, around Halloween, the houses would decorate with some subtle decorations and lights, nothing too creepy. The kids from the neighborhood would walk around and trick-or-treat, and even the social holidays like this were pleasant. My parents were the picture of suburban life. My dad was a financial advisor, always dressing nicely, and my mom stayed home, but she was pretty involved with the local library and ran the local book club. There was a point in my childhood where my dad started changing. He was always a social person, always friendly and talkative, but at some point he started listening to a certain radio show and then reading some things online. This was 03, so the internet was a bit more of the Wild West. And he started on this streak of paranoia that became borderline obsessive. It started subtle enough. He had changed the locks on the front door and then added a chain lock. The kind where you can look out, but not open the door all the way. Our front door didn't have a window, so you had to either look out the window that was close by, or open the door to see who was there. Then, he added these motion-activated floodlights that would light up the neighborhood like a stadium, any time one of the neighbor cats would cross our yard. My mom would joke that he was preparing for the apocalypse, with how much he was securing the house, but... I could tell by the look on her face that she was concerned. Our front door had a motion sensor on it. It ended up with four locks. All of our windows were all but bolted shut, and he was starting to hoard canned goods in the basement. He was pretty much a bunker away from being a full-on prepper. That year, on the day before Halloween, actually, I had come home after a long day of school and then soccer practice, to find my dad at the kitchen table, surrounded by tools and a stack of new security cameras. This was early 2000s, so they weren't the kind that you can get today. They were all fully wired, and required to have that central box connecting all the units. When I asked what he was doing, he responded with, I'm going to put up cameras. This way, I'll be able to watch all directions around the house. <laughs> with these bad boys, no one is going to sneak up on us. I wanted to ask him who exactly it was that he was expecting to sneak up on us, but by this point, talking to him was almost feeling like a chore. Everything was about security. Everything was about, quote, keeping us safe, which I understand to a point, but at the same time, safe from what? We lived in a suburb where everyone else knew everyone else. And while I understand not getting complacent, we really weren't in much danger. My dad spent that entire night putting up the cameras. He didn't even make dinner for me, so when my mom got home at 8 from the book club and I hadn't eaten, she was pretty upset with him. And there was definitely some yelling at that point. I think my mom had had enough as well. That night, I was lying in bed just thinking about life, as preteens often do, and I was watching the clouds pass in front of the moon when I heard someone talking. I could hear my dad's voice, angry 
and demanding. And then I heard what sounded like desperate yells from someone else. I was curious. I was a kid, so I wanted to know what was going on. I crept out of bed and down the hallway into the living room, and what I saw made my blood run cold. I saw my dad standing in the middle of the living room, his face flush with a mix of fear and rage, his shoulders hunched. I saw my mom standing in the door to the kitchen, one hand pressed to her mouth, and I could tell that she was panicking. Then I saw something confusing. The front door was open, and there was a man that I had never seen standing there in the doorway, with his hands up trying to say something. But it was like he couldn't speak out of sheer terror. And then I saw why he was terrified. My dad was holding a handgun trained right on him. Now, I want to say that I completely understand the need for defense and security. I want that to be clear. And I do personally appreciate the Second Amendment, but this situation, it wasn't it. I want to point out that the front door was open. There were four locks on that door, which I now know to mean that my dad had opened it. I don't know if he knew the guy was out there. I don't know if it was just a random run-in of the two men, but the fact that my dad had a gun on him... A gun that neither my mom nor I even knew that he had, and that he had just installed the security cameras that watched every square inch of the yard, makes me think that my dad knew this man was at our door, and that he had basically created this scenario. I don't know if it was because he wanted it to happen, or if his paranoia had gotten so bad that he felt like he needed to take it head on, but it is what it is. My dad kept screaming at this man to not move, but then also screamed at him to get on his knees, conflicting instructions that I could tell were causing a panic in this man. When I got into the living room from the hallway, I did something that I will always regret, because I feel like it made the situation worse. I asked what was going on. The man looked at me, and I could tell that he was crying. My dad shot me a look over the shoulder and yelled, Get back in your room! I just stood there in confused silence, watching this scenario not move for several seconds, until the man lowered his arms and started trying to talk. I'm sure he just wanted to explain why he was there, but my dad didn't give him the chance. The second the man dropped his arms, my dad pulled the trigger. I stood there and watched my dad squeeze off five shots, all of them hitting the man, who stumbled back and then fell to the ground. The silence that followed that moment was so deep and all-consuming that, for a second, I thought I had gone deaf. My dad's face was frozen, his mouth slightly open, and his gun still aiming at where the man had been standing. My mom broke the silence when she started sobbing and screaming at my dad, asking what he had done. I swear it was mere seconds before I heard the sound of police sirens and saw the lights in front of our house. The cops ran up with their weapons drawn, yelling at my dad to drop his gun as they tried to figure all of this out. I think that was when my dad realized that he was still holding it, because he actually looked confused and scared when he put it on the ground. They did pull him out of the house to talk to him, and they then talked to my mom and I as they tried to figure out the bloody scene on our front porch. To kind of wrap this up as quickly as I can, the man was a neighbor. He lived on the street behind ours. I had never seen him before, but he apparently lived one road over in a house that kind of looked similar to ours. Come to find out, he had actually been drinking at a bar down the way. He'd had way too many, and he had walked home, but at some point he must have gotten confused and turned down our road, and got to our house. Now, I don't know if he tried to open the door, or if he had just knocked or something, but I'm guessing that my dad saw him and opened the door to confront him, which was the wrong way to handle this situation. The end of the investigation determined that it was a tragic accident, 
but that my father was defending himself and his family, so it was considered justified. I don't think that tragic is a strong enough word for what happened, but I don't have the vocabulary to say what it really was. This man was drunk and confused, and did nothing more than stumble up to the wrong house. He wasn't armed, he didn't break in, and my dad created the scenario where his life was in danger more than he had. It got worse when I found out that this guy was actually the father to a girl in my class. She was out of school for a while, but when she came back, I couldn't ever get the nerve to talk to her. What was I supposed to say? Hey, sorry my dad killed yours? It may not sound related, but my family never celebrated Halloween after that. My dad never put out the decorations, and we never carved pumpkins again. I think this took a toll on my dad, and he never wanted anyone to come up to our front porch at night ever again. I will say that my dad was also never the same after that night. He kept up his paranoia, but he became less social, less talkative, and less involved in my life until he eventually died of a massive heart attack at 48. I'm not sure that there's a lesson to this story, other than to say that security is important, but it's also important to never will a scenario where you shoot a man for protection into existence. There's a certain point where, in his pursuit for security, my father became a hammer. And when you're a hammer, you do everything you can to find a nail. I've been doing a lot of soul searching in my adult life. A lot of thinking about how things were when I was young. I don't talk about my childhood at all to anyone because every time I think about it, I want to curl up into a ball and cry for hours on end. That's not a healthy way to live, though. So, I've been working on getting things off my chest and putting them out into the world to try to get closure. I know that things were trying for me when I was young. I know that I was raised in a household that wasn't loving. In fact, quite the opposite. And I know that none of it was my fault. I have to keep telling myself this as I work through my issues, something my therapist told me. I have to continue to tell myself that it wasn't my fault while I try to put things into perspective. So, I decided today that I would write this out and submit it to try to work through some things. The story isn't necessarily scary. It's more sad than anything, but I want to write it out and hopefully you can use it. And if not, that's fine too. I'm only going to write about one specific event in this story, and maybe I'll write about a few of the other things from before and after it eventually, but this was probably when things were the absolute worst for me as a child. I guess I should start by explaining a few things about my parents. My mother and father did not love me. They probably didn't even like me. They told me as much a few times that they didn't love me, and after the first few times I would cry, but the words started to mean less and less each time they said them. If my parents could have found the right buyer, they would have probably sold me for a baggie of some sort of illicit substance in a heartbeat. They were druggies, pretty much getting high any time I wasn't in the house. I guess they respected me enough to not do it while I was there but they were usually too far gone to even talk to by the time I got home from school. Our house was always a mess. My parents never had money to buy me new clothes, so growing up, I would have to wear things that were a size too small for me, or sometimes my aunt would drop off my older cousin stuff that was a size too big. I always looked like such a clown, and I knew it, but thankfully some people could see through the situation and not judge me for it. They could judge my parents all they wanted. I didn't care. I had one friend, Matt, whose parents were really nice people. A bit strict, but they were friendly enough. 
I always felt safe at Matt's house. Like nothing would happen to me. And I think that's why I grew so attached to them. So when they offered to pay for me to go to camp with Mark one summer, the summer I turned nine, it was a no-brainer. I didn't even bother asking my parents. I figured what's the point. I just told them that I was staying with Matt for a few days, neither of them acknowledged me as expected, and that was it. The camp was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by trees and mountains, with a huge lake in the middle. This is probably my fondest memory growing up, those days where I got to feel normal around boys my age. I made a few new friends, and spent time being a kid. We hiked, roasted marshmallows, stayed up late and told scary stories in the cabin. I didn't participate in the scary stories, though. I could have. I could have told him a few interesting ones, but I didn't. Matt and I even snuck out one night and went down to the lake, just watching the stars and talking about what we wanted to do when we grew up. Yes, I'm being nostalgic, because it's what I wanted to hold on to more than my home life back then. But... Of course, the camp was only for a week. On the drive back, I remember feeling this tight knot in my stomach. Would my parents yell at me for being gone so long? I never told them where I was actually going, but would they really care? Also, could I do anything to make this last longer? When they pulled up to my house, it looked the same as always. Run down, unkempt, and dark. Matt's parents asked if my folks were home or if they needed to stick around and wait for them, but I lied and said that they were probably home. I told them that my dad worked nights, so they might have just been asleep, because it was the only thing I could think to use as a good excuse at 3pm on a Friday afternoon for why my house looked like it had sat vacant for months. I waved goodbye to them as they pulled off, and pulled my backpack tighter, and headed up the front steps. I didn't look back. I didn't want Matt's parents to see me hesitate. I fumbled with my key, and when I stepped inside, the silence hit me like a wall. The house was empty. Completely empty. I remember standing in the entryway, just staring into the dark living room, hoping I would hear a TV on in the background, or the sound of my mom yelling at me for letting the flies in but it was dead quiet. I don't know how long I stood there waiting for anything to happen, but eventually, I just tossed my bag and wandered into the kitchen to get something to eat. For some reason, I remember the fridge being full with a couple takeout containers, and an empty bottle of ketchup. I don't know why I remember the damn ketchup bottle, but I remember it sitting there on the center of the top shelf with no ketchup in it. I didn't panic, though. I was sort of used to my parents not really being there, even when they were. I figured they would show up sooner or later and yell at me for being home alone, which is something they had done before. Yes, they actually yelled at me and punished me for being home when they weren't there one time, even though they left me there. When I woke up the next morning, they still weren't home. The house was still empty. I ate some old cereal, no milk though, so I ended up eating it with water from the sink. I tried to keep myself busy with cleaning my room, drawing in my sketchbook, and just doing nothing. At least it being a Saturday, I did get to watch some cartoons, which I never got to do, so I had that going for me. That night was actually where things went, I guess, awry. I'm not really sure how to put it, but I'll explain. It was around 9 p.m. I was sitting in my bedroom with my lamp on, and I think I was drawing one of the Power Rangers mechs when I heard the sound of glass breaking. I panicked for a moment, as any nine-year-old would, but it occurred to me that it was probably just my parents coming home and breaking something as they stumbled through the living room. I let out a sigh and headed down the stairs to greet them for whatever reason. When I got to the bottom, a man yelled at me to not move, and pointed a gun at me. At that moment, I thought I was going to die. I remember immediately losing the air from my lungs and feeling like I was going to throw up. 
After a moment or two, it must have clicked for the guy that I was just a little kid. And he lowered the gun, but kept staring at me. After a few seconds, he said something like, Hey there, I'm not going to hurt you, just don't scream, okay? I wanted to be brave, so I just responded with, I'm not going to scream. Trying to sound tough, I guess. He stepped up to where I was standing and asked if my parents were upstairs. And I told him no, that they weren't home. He stood there for a moment. I think he was trying to gauge whether or not I was lying. He told me to stay put, and that he'd be right back. Then he went upstairs and searched from room to room. After he came back down, he asked me when they left. And I had to tell him that I honestly didn't know. He asked me a few questions about them, where they went, when I last saw them, etc. I think the more that I answered, the more this guy started to feel bad for me, because I could see in his eyes that he knew I was being honest. I had no idea where they were, when they left, all that. I told him that I went to summer camp for a week and when I got home, they were gone and I hadn't seen them since. He asked me how old I was, and I told him honesty that I was nine. It was at this point that this guy pulled his mask off, and he just looked at me like I was the most pathetic thing he had ever seen. He looked like a pretty normal guy, nothing special, just long blonde hair, a little rough, and he seemed okay, despite the breaking and entering. This guy actually sat on the couch with me for a few moments, watching TV with me, and asking me about myself. At one point, I told him that I hadn't eaten anything but cereal since I got home, and he actually seemed shocked. He got up and went into the kitchen. I could hear him opening and closing the cabinets. When he came back into the living room, he looked like he was beyond upset with the situation, and actually asked me if I liked McDonald's. I told him that I loved McDonald's, and this was when the two of us, myself, and the man that broke into my parents' house with a gun, looking for my deadbeat parents, took a short drive to the local McDonald's for chicken nuggets. We got back to my house, and he came in, this time through the door since I had a key, and we sat there eating McDonald's and watching whatever was on TV. It's a sad fact that this man that was probably looking to kill or rob my parents, had acted more like a father in the couple hours I knew him than my real father. When we got done eating, he said that he had to get going, and I kid you not, I asked him if I could go with him. I think he would have said yes, if not for the whole criminal aspect of it. He said that I had to stay there, but that he would make sure I was okay that nothing would happen to me. He then apologized to me for everything. I thanked him for the nuggets, and then he left. Surprisingly enough, he actually kept his promise, and he did make sure I was okay. I found out about 45 minutes later that he had called in an anonymous tip to the cops about a child being left alone for days. The cops showed up at the house, noticed the broken window, and when I answered, and told them that my parents weren't home and that the window was broken because some man with a gun broke it, well, they took the whole thing pretty seriously. This was especially true when they found the drug paraphernalia in my parents' room. I've written a lot here, and I won't bore you with the legal aspect of all of what happened, but I do want to at least wrap this up by telling you why things went down this way. That man was, apparently, an enforcer for a big-name drug dealer in my town. My parents owed this drug dealer a lot of money, and he wanted to get paid. So we sent that man to get the money by any means necessary. Apparently, my parents somehow caught wind that they were going to get a visit from the dealer, so they took off. They packed up two bags, got in their car, and they headed west. At no point in time did they realize they were leaving me behind. I guess because I hadn't been there for a couple of days, though I'm not certain they would have taken me with them if I were even there. 
My parents were eventually located. They were in a drug house, both completely out of their minds on heroin. Apparently, my mother was, in simpler words, inches from death with how much she had injected. I was taken into custody by the state while they tried to figure out what to do with me. I will say that I never saw my father again after this event. He died in prison. I don't know, nor do I care, how. I did see my mother after a few years, but it was only to tell her that I hated her for how she ruined my childhood. I ended up in the foster system, and thankfully, I did have a decent run there. Better than most. I was put into an adoptive family that at least seemed like they cared, certainly more than my real parents. I know that this was long-winded, and like I said, not scary, but it's my story, and I wanted to share it. If nothing else, it helps get it off my chest. So, thank you, Raven, for allowing me to do so. And if you use this story, thank you for that as well. From the summer of 2021 to 2022, I was a lifeguard at a small beach called Adams Point Beach, which is located in Quishy Lake, New York. I didn't really enjoy my job, to be honest. Besides making friends with the other lifeguards, I wasn't getting paid enough money, and my final paycheck for the summer of 2021 was $350. To make matters even more difficult, I come from a family with no money. I live on a farm and my parents fight with each other a lot. I never went to college because my family can't afford it, so I have to work two jobs every day. One from 9 to 5 and the other from 6 to 11, where I only get paid $15 an hour. In the summer of 2022, my boss, for whatever reason, had demoted me to a sub-lifeguard. This really pissed me off because I couldn't see my friends. One day in August of 2022, I was called in to substitute for a lifeguard as this lifeguard was busy that day, and only one other lifeguard was available. Usually there are three, but that day was a shortage of staff. The start of that day was like how a day would usually start. Unfortunately, that changed in the afternoon. My 30-minute shift on this lifeguard chair was done and the other lifeguard swapped with me. I walked back to the shed and went inside of it. About 10 minutes later, while I was on my phone, I heard a bunch of screaming and crying outside of the shed with the door closed. I didn't know what was going on, so I walked outside, and what I saw next is an image that I will never unsee for the rest of my life. What I saw was the lifeguard along with four other people, sitting with a woman on a surf rescue board with both of her legs severed off. I felt petrified, but I had to help the other lifeguard as it was my job to save people. I helped carry the surfboard, but I looked behind me as it was so brutal to look at what was in front of me. I helped everyone place the board on a table with the woman lying on it right next to the shed. Thankfully, the police and medics were already called. I asked what had happened. One guy said that a guy by himself in a speedboat wasn't looking where he was driving the boat, and people told him to stop and slow down, but he was in his own world. He then ran over the woman, and then would come to a stop like three seconds later. He apparently took off like a coward would do. I could not believe what I was hearing. I then told the man to describe what the speedboat looked like. I asked him because this was a very small lake and I pretty much knew everyone who comes to this lake and lives right next to it. He said that it was a blue jet boat. When the man told me this, I felt as if my whole world was coming to an end. That was my dad's boat. He's the only one who owns a jet boat on this lake. I then saw everything turn blurry, and then it all went to black. I woke up with two EMTs side by side next to me. They asked if I was alright. I told them I was fine, 
and I went to go grab my water bottle and then drank the water as if I had never drank water before in my life. I then exited the beach area as my boss told everyone to go home because of what had happened today. I got in my car and drove home, which was about three to four minutes away. As I got home, I turned off my car and stepped out to see my dad pacing back and forth nervously through the kitchen window. I then rushed inside of the house, and I went on a full-on rampage on my father. I confronted him and then called him a coward for leaving the scene of the accident. He was breathing so hard. I had never seen him breathing like this before. As I was still yelling at him and my adrenaline was kicking in more than ever, I shoved him and then started hitting him. He told me to calm the F down. After about 10 hits, I finally pushed him to his full limits, and he punched me so hard that I fell to the ground, and my ears were ringing. He then yelled at me to stay the F down, you little B, before running out of the house and speeding off somewhere. I continued to bawl my eyes out. I was never close with my dad. I never came to him for help when needed, but never in a million years would I thought that he would end up doing something so horrific. About an hour and a half later, my mom finally came home after going to the hospital to check on the woman whom my father had injured. As my mother walked through the door, she hugged me for what felt like an eternity and we cried together. We sat down together at the dinner table and she told me some good news and bad news. The good news was that the woman was alive and okay. The bad news was that both of her legs were amputated off and that they would have to be refitted with bionic legs. I felt so relieved that she had survived, but I was still so devastated that my father took off, never even apologized and never came to see the woman in the hospital. My mother asked me where her husband went. I told my mom that he took off. We tried calling him, but it went straight to voicemail. The police were called again, and we filed a missing persons report on my dad. In the next few weeks, the police tried searching everywhere for him and came up empty-handed. It was the worst three weeks of my life. I quit my job straight after due to the traumatic sight I had seen on that very day. I've been seeing a psychologist three times a week now. Each day, I was very slowly starting to get better and better but I still have a long way to go. I also only work one job now, and have been promoted at my job, which now I get paid 25 an hour. This makes me happier, as I still have some luck in this world. I have not seen my father since. I don't really miss him that much after he attacked me and calling me a B. I wish I could tell you that that's where the story ends, but sadly it isn't and the next part gets even worse. Fast forwarding to sometime in mid-July during this past summer of 2024, I decided to go kayaking at 7 o'clock at night. I wanted to exercise my brain and needed some free time for myself. I took off in my kayak. I kayaked in the area of around 30 feet deep, then kayaking to the shallower area. My destination was to stop at a land area to walk on it and to take a break from kayaking as my arms were getting sore. During this whole time kayaking, I was looking at the water beneath me. As I got to around 15 feet deep, what I saw on the bottom of the ground underneath the water was textbook horror. I saw a dead body of an old woman. I paddled out there so fast and then reached my destination that I originally planned to go and after pulling my kayak to shore, I ran to the grass area and threw up around five times. Luckily, I had my phone on me, so I called 911. The police came ten minutes later, about seven cop cars showed up, along with the SWAT team. I gave them my story, and they told me to evacuate the area as it will be going under investigation. About two weeks later, we got some of the worst news ever more so than anyone who lived in my town had ever gotten before. The detective told us that this person was murdered. They also traced DNA and fingerprints to try to find out who the perpetrator was, and it worked. When they revealed who the killer was, I was nowhere near prepared to find out who it would be. 
it was my estranged father. Why the hell would he come back to this town if his main goal was to try to escape? I couldn't think of any motive of why he would even kill this person. This was so devastating that the next day, I packed most of my clothes and drove off all the way downstate to New York City. I needed a break from this so-called curse that was going on in upstate in my hometown. I stayed in New York City for about three weeks in a cheap hotel and then came back. The police, this time along with the FBI, searched again for my father and yet again nothing. I quit my job after this, and I'm currently unemployed. Luckily, I have my little sister who had just graduated high school take over for me. As you are hearing this story, as of now, there is still no updates on where my father could possibly be. He could be living in another state far away, or he could have fled the country. I never want to see my father ever again after hearing that he murdered another human being. If there's more news revolving around this case, I will keep you posted. So, this, my friends, was an absolutely devastating collection of parent stories. Stories where the parents the problem. Um, not much to say about this one. Um, I can't really give a, a cheery anecdote to this kind of collection, to these stories, because these, these were painful stories to read, honestly. And I'm sure they're going to be just as painful to hear, so... Hopefully, you guys got through them unscathed. Hopefully, you were able to listen to them. But again, if, if not, well, you probably won't hear this, but if not, I do understand. Because again, these were... These were tough. These were... These were intense. Very intense stories, so... Um, yeah. Thank you to all three of you who sent your stories in to me. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I understand these stories probably weren't easy to write for any of you, but again, thank you. If you listened to these stories and you did enjoy the collection, please do consider hitting that like button. If you're new to the channel and enjoyed what you heard, please consider subscribing, as that helps the channel grow. You can also leave me a comment with your thoughts, how you're doing, how it's going, etc., etc., and of course, if you have any stories, please do consider sending them in by going to AsTheRavenDreams.com. You can also join Patreon memberships, get early access to content like this, buy a signed poster at the coffee link, that's KOFI down below the video, and yeah, you can listen Spotify, Pandora, Audible, pretty much everywhere. All that said, friends, I want you to remember, you are loved. You are loved valid. You are important. You are the best you that you can be. Do not forget it, and don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. And until next time, my friends, much love, and sleep well.